Hey, thanks a lot for coming this morning and uh, for, for your attention to this important topic. We have a really great state. We have the greatest snow on earth and so many amazing outdoor opportunities from rock climbing our deserts to scaling our majestic mountain peaks, rafting our wildest rivers, and fishing our cold mountain streams. Our cities are clean, are safe, and the, for the most part clean. But our future is unknown. Our state is growing very rapidly. In the last 10 years, St. George, which is shown here, um, had the most rapid growth in the nation. And in fact, th throughout our state, almost 24% growth was observed from 2000 to 2010. Um, with outside of, outside of the St. George area, most of that is occurring along the Wasatch Front, the Wasatch Back, and Tooele County. Our population right now is a little over 2.7 million. Contrary to public, public thought, uh, most of this growth is internal. Utah has the highest fertility rate in the United States, 81 children per 1,000 women, compared to 58 nationally. And it's interesting to note also that most of our kids are born to married couples who are U.S. citizens. And this is exemplified in this old postcard I found that says, Utah's best crop, one that never fails. <laughs> so the point is that we're going to have rapid growth in a small space. For the most part, Utah is already an urban state with 85% of our population centered here on the I-15 corridor from Payson up to Brigham City and that's not expected to change. We are going to grow in a very narrow, confined area that's bordered by mountains and either the, the Great Salt Lake or the deserts. So the Wasatch Front will become increasingly urbanized. And this growth, for the most part, is not from people migrating to Utah. It's mostly from internal uh, reproduction. Um, what about our future? This growth with it brings with it a number of um, problems, and you might have seen in Forbes magazine a few weeks ago that Salt Lake City was ranked number ninth for the most toxic city in the nation. Air quality is an obvious problem for many of us on the Wasatch Front and in Cache Valley. Um, do we want our vistas to look like this or like this? This is just recently this winter outside of Murray. Will our growth be constrained by water resources? Um, this cartoon says it all. Nothing screams the American dream like an absurdly lush lawn in the middle of the desert. Second to ne Nevada, Utah is the second driest state in the country. So I would argue that yes, water is going to limit our growth. Most of our precipitation occurs as snow, and we already use about one-third of our renewable water supply. This means that this water is not available for subsequent use afterward. So to meet our current thirst for water, we already use interbasin transfers to move water from the Colorado drainage through Strawberry Reservoir here over to the Wasatch Front. This is all occurring in the context of climate change. This graph shows the departure from average temperature in the northern hemisphere from the, for the last thousand years. And it's showing that our temperatures in the northern hemisphere are warming. For Utah, the predict, climate prediction suggests that it's going to alter our balance of, of rain versus snow towards more rainfall than snowfall. And snow melt is already starting on average in some places two to three weeks earlier than historical records. So this is likely to change the availability of our, our water resources. Uh, most of our infrastructure for water is, is built with the, in mind that snowmelt supplies our water. And as the, as the climate shifts to a more rainfall dominated system, will our reservoirs be able to handle that? The last game changer is dust. Uh, in some cases, we get dust storms so big that you can see them from space. So this is a satellite image showing a dust cloud in July 2003. Um, 
what we don't know very well is how this dust might impact our water uh, quantity and water quality. So all of this is provide, dri driving the context of, of this collaborative research project where Utah is growing. We're expected to double our population size by 2040. We have limited water. The climate is changing. And then we have this dust and, and also human-generated particles in cities that probably will affect our snowmelt and potentially affect water quality. So in order to envision a sustainable future for Utah, one that sustains our society, economy, and environment, we need to understand the linkages between people and cities, the mountains, and deserts. Now, to think about how this might work out, climate and, and water availability, particulates and human emissions, land use, water use, uh, population growth, and, whoops, and management decisions um, make for a very complicated picture. And these are just some of the things that might affect sustainability in Utah. And um, I think in order to simplify this, it's, it's easier to think about what links these three ecosystems. Dust, water, and people are one way of simplifying it. So let me take you through some conceptual diagrams that show how these things are linked. And we'll start in the west and move our way east. First, in the desert systems, we have um, land use practices that are somewhat changing somewhat, as well as invasive species. Bro Bromus tectorum is a cheatgrass, which changes the fire regime in our um, rangelands. And that makes it more susceptible to produce dust, which then can be transported by wind towards our uh, cities on the Wasatch Front. On the Wasatch Front, our air quality can be impacted by dust. Watch out for this weekend. There's going to be a big one tomorrow, I think. People in cities also combust fossil fuels. And this can lead to production of particulates that have a quality about them that acts like fertilizer. So they're reactive nitrogen particles. And those can be transported from the cities to our mountains. Whoops, I went backwards, sorry. People are linked to both deserts and mountains by their choice to recreate in these environments. In terms of how these are linked to mountains, dust from the desert can be deposited on our mountains in the snow, on the snowpack. Humans can also produce these reactive nitrogen particles that are deposited in the mountains, and we recreate there. This is likely to impact the timing of snowmelt and the amount of water that's available for our use in the city. So to put them all together, here's the dust, reactive nitrogen, people. Dust, water, and people link these three ecosystems. So some very simple questions that we're trying to ask first is where is the dust coming from and why? We'll have an environmental monitoring network located at nine stations throughout the state and three of them will be located in desert um, ecosystems where we'll be measuring things like uh, climate variables, soil moisture, and so forth. Um, this is a, shot, a photograph showing a, a burned plot of uh, rangeland in the West Desert, showing that this type of environment probably is a good place for dust generation. Um, we know that these desert areas can be sources of dust. In 2009, in the summertime, there was this big plume, almost 160 miles long, from the Milford Flat Lake Severe area that you can see is heading straight for the Wasatch Front. These photos Jim Elringer uh, shared with us showing Mount Olympus obscured by the dust compared to a few days later. So these dust storms impact our air quality. And when they land on, when this dust falls on snow, it can affect um, the dynamics of snow melt in the snowpack. Cities also can generate particles. And this graph is showing you the carbon dioxide concentration in the atmosphere in Salt Lake City over nine and a half years. Now I realize that carbon dioxide is not a particle, but we can use it as a proxy for, for showing the impact of humans on the atmosphere. Note these peaks in the carbon dioxide concentration that occur every winter during inversions. 
Note also here at the end, uh, the first week of January, I'm going to illustrate the effect of humans on the particulates in the atmosphere during this particular inversion that happened the first week of um, January this year. So early in the morning, 945, this is the view at the Salt Lake City Haze Cam, which is located in Murray. An hour later, an hour later, by mid-afternoon, the view was entirely obscured, and it got worse. Here's what it looks like on a nice, clear day. So humans definitely can impact the atmospheric particles that occur in our city. And when this stuff falls on the snow, the question is, how do these particulates, and here I'm talking about dust from the desert and also these human-generated particles, how does this affect our water? Um, again, we'll use our environmental monitoring network. This is showing a site up in Logan Canyon at the School Forest um, where they've been monitoring the effect of snow melt on snow soil moisture dynamics, and we'll be using this site to evaluate the effect of dust as well. One of our colleagues at the University of Utah, Dave Bowling, and his student have been doing experimental dust additions to the snowpack outside of Salt Lake City. And basically what they do is they take a shot vac and they blow dust on experimental plots. And you can see some of the results from last year. This is showing the snow water equivalent of the snowpack. Starts out the same for the control plot and the um, experimental plots. And these red lines are showing you that the addition of dust makes the snow melt faster. Um, in terms of what the dust does to the chemistry of the snow, that's less well known. Um, this graph is showing you statewide the amount of nutrients as nitrogen and phosphorus that are applied to land. Um, for nitrogen, shown here, one-third of the nitrogen that falls on the land in Utah is coming from the atmosphere. That's this blue pie right here. The rest is fertilizer and manure. Um, this nitrogen that's coming from the atmosphere is, is found only in the wet deposition. That means that it's, it's nitrogen that's dissolved in the water. We know nothing about dry deposition, which is likely to contain more phosphorus. So the dust will probably have nitrogen and phosphorus in it as well. We don't know. Um, so the question is, what will this do to our water um, quantity and quality? And really, the most important thing is, what can we do, do about this? What can we do to have a sustainable future for our state. This will we'll continue to use our environmental monitoring network and will monitor the effect of, of uh, water coming out of the mountains and also air quality using environmental stations that are located in the Wasatch Front in the cities. And this is just showing you the inside of one of Jim Elringer's CO2 monitoring stations. Um, part of this, this environmental mo monitoring network in the city will involve a green infrastructure facility, which will be testing different types of um, constructed plant uh, patches or, or engineered types of green solutions to see how water quality changes as we move through, say, a, a particular type of storm drain uh, system with plants. Um, and the other aspect of this will be to establish an urban futures laboratory with uh, urban planners at the University of Utah where folks who are actively involved in, in city planning can come explore the data that we're generating and evaluate it in the context of their uh, design. One thing that, that I'm most particularly interested in is diagnosing and understanding the causes and consequences of humans on water quality. And one of the things that we see when humans impact streams is something called urban stream syndrome. These are streams that are degraded, that have high turbidity, lots of exotic species, and um, poor water quality that you certainly wouldn't want your kid to swim in. This is on the Jordan River uh, in North Salt Lake County. So finding answers to this, I've talked a little bit about the science behind our proposal, but really it's going to take a concerted effort. And as a beehive state, I think that we as a, as a group can, can work towards this. Dr. Miller mentioned that this project 
um, IUTA, which stands for Integrated Urban Transitions and Arid Region Hydro Sustainability. Basically, we're trying to understand the linkages between water, dust, and people. And the project is managed by Jim Elringer, uh, myself, David Tarbotten, Larry Baxter, and Laura Hunter. So that's the science part. We need to get the science right. But a big part of this also is raising a crop of, of kids who are well-trained in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics that can help understand these complex systems and provide innovative solutions. And Laura Hunter, who is with the Utah Education Network, will be um, spearheading this effort. Uh, addition to, in addition to providing K through 12 educational modules, we'll be engaging teachers to empower them to uh, teach them the com complexity of the, the, these environmental issues. And finally, we have a lot of partners, in, ranging from the Utah system of higher education to government agencies to Envision Utah and um, a number of other groups. And with that, I'd like to close and, and offer the opportunity to answer any questions. And if you'd like more information or if you'd like to become a partner, visit our website, utahapscore.org. Thanks. Any questions? Yes. Well, if, if snow melt occurs at a, a very, so if it's occurring more rapidly, it may um, penetrate into the soil more than runoff. And so if it stays in the soil, then it will not make it to our reservoirs. Or if it's coming down, the big, big issue, especially with climate change, is if it's coming down at the wrong time, we may not be able to, to use our reservoirs as effectively to keep that water where we need it for later. Yes. In, in the context of, of what people are, are going to use it for, we're going to use it for irrigation and drinking water. Other questions? The question is what per percentage is pumped out of aquifers? And I don't know the answer to that question. Um, I know in Cache Valley we have a number of wells that are used for, for agriculture, but I think most of the wells are used for drinking water. And I know in Cache Valley we've had two or three wells that have been shut down because of excess nitrate, which um, is, is one of these reactive nitrogen species. Well, we need to work together to define what we want to, to have for a future, first of all. And then I think that as scientists, we can provide you with an understanding of, of what the system is like now and what the potential scenarios are for the future. And as a society, we have to make a decision together for, for what we want to do. So I think um, if, if this project is funded, we'll be engaging in this type of outreach with various stakeholders where we can get a sense of, here's what we know. Um, you know, how can, we, how can we make informed decisions about where to place new development? Do we want to continue to expand into undeveloped lands? Or do we want to build up? That type of thing. But that's the, that's the million dollar question. Billion dollar question. How, so the question is, how dependable is the Colorado River? And that's another billion dollar question. There's a lot of concern that by 2050, that Lake Mead will be dry. Um, it's not reliable, and, it, and our use of it right now is probably not sustainable. Doom and gloom, April Fool's Day, <laughs> yeah. The, 
the question is, am I able to speak to the raising snow level? And I, I am not uh, the type of hydrologist that has that expertise, and I don't know what the projections are for Utah. Um, I saw a talk last year by uh, Mark Williams, who is a snow hydrologist at the, at the University of Colorado, and he was here for Utah State University's um, spring runoff conference. And he spoke to the project projections that say that for Utah and Colorado, we're not really expected to have a decrease in the overall amount of snow, but it is projected that we will have an increased um, lower snow elevation. And so in terms of, of a ski area operation, the challenge will be where can we continue to make snow? And is it going to be feasible to have our, our areas down at this elevation versus higher up? But he was projecting that for Utah, it, it should be higher as well. Mm -hmm. The Park City, um, I've worked with the guys at the Snyderville Wastewater Treatment Facility and they're very progressive and have a, a really great facility for treating wastewater. Um, so I know that, that the Park City area is very concerned about these issues and they're doing a, a, an admirable job. Yes. Sure. I didn't show any. Yeah, what it does is it changes the albedo, which changes the heat balance of the snow and makes it absorb more heat so that it melts faster. That, maybe I can talk, I, I'll draw you a picture after the talk. <laughs> yeah. Um, there's a paper that just came out by our colleague David Tarbot who's working on this, that very question, and uh, probably. I honestly don't know what dust would do to wetlands. If the dust has a lot of chemi chemicals associated with it, it could impact the water quality. Um, I'm not sure that the magnitude of dust deposition on the wetland would affect the water depth or anything like that. It's not something that we've looked at at all, but that's an interesting question. Yeah, that's a great. Yeah, that's an excellent question, <laughs> and it's it's a huge challenge, and it's one that scientists are not trained to deal with. Um, I think that we need to engage stakeholders, you guys, um, in the design of our studies, and make our our efforts as transparent as we possibly can, and. Um, not approach people saying, well, we have all the answers, because we don't. But, but I think that by uh, fostering a, a level of transparency and, and open communication from the very beginning, that that might help address your, your concern.
the education part, and especially young kids, and having them move forward with this? That's a great question. So the, the question was, what's the time frame for this study, and um, especially given that the impacts are not going to happen until until sometime in the future, and then how are we going to engage children in, in our education efforts? Um, Laura Hunter, who's with the Utah Education Network, and she had RSVP, I don't know if she's here. Hi. Um, she has proposed a suite of, of activities. Um, some of them include preparing um, multilingual uh, films that will be distributed over the internet to kids across the state, so in their native languages and youth language, for example, um, talking about environmental issues and modules that illustrate complexities of, of environmental science. Um, we'll have a science camp hosted at the University of Utah where kids in high school can come for a week or so and stay in the dorms and then work with some of the scientists going out and collecting the field data, um, doing the uh, simulations in the Urban Futures Lab and whatnot. Um, providing teacher training activities where uh, science, scientists will participate in um, designing modules for, these, for the secondary and, and elementary schools, um, bringing the teachers into a place where we can present this information and work with them to um, help them develop the curriculum that the, that's most appropriate for their school. So those are some of the examples.